everyone. Welcome to our quarterly webinar. I am so excited to have Joe Mueller, who is one of our newest instructors, lead this amazing webinar on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And Joe, I am going to kind of let you share your background, but it's full circle because I know at once he was a student for UCSB Pace, and here we are having him uh, as one of our instructors uh, to teach the Child Life Program. So we're so excited. Um, and yes, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, um, Sunny, both for this opportunity, um, as well as um, that introduction. Um, can you see the screen at this point? Yes, everything looks great. Okay, cool. cool. All right. So um, good, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are watching from. Um, but thank you for this opportunity to speak on this this topic that I'm passionate about. Um, I have been, um, my undergrad was actually in IT, but also sociology. So the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion um, comes from, my passion for it comes a lot from my, my background in school. Um, and then I continue to bring that within my professional life. Um, so um, as Sunny said, my, my name is Joe Muller. And I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, and <clears throat> I learned that not everyone throughout my studies and my experiences, I've learned that not everyone exists within the context and bubble, um, which I did growing up. Um, and once that bubble burst um, from my education, from various life experiences, my eyes were able to be open to so much more that I realize is out there. Um, so first, I want to establish where I'm coming from when we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I am one, one, one person cannot be fully culturally competent. And that's actually a terminology that is no encouraged not to be used anymore. Instead, we prefer to use culturally, um, cultural humility. Um, it means to live in the mindset of openness, uh, learning, acknowledging that we all have biases. Um, and biases don't make us like a bad person or make us um, doing something wrong, but rather they're a natural part of our human life. And we just need to be open to learning, open to feedback in order to acknowledge those biases and how they are impacting our interactions with other people, our perceptions of other people, and of course, the professional aspect of our practice in our clinical work. Um, so by living this, I aim to be open to correction and criticism as well. Um, I want to acknowledge that I am, uh, I have a lot of privilege as a white cisgender male. Um, so I do have a lot of privilege and I also come from the queer community. So I do have some stakeholdership in, in some, some of these topics we're going to be addressing. Um, and my experiences as a queer person has influenced and helped when I said that bubble that kind of burst my, my, my perspective, um, it helped me to understand not everyone comes from the same experiences as me um, and what, what that might be like when somebody gets treated differently. Um, I learned that once coming out and acknowledging I was part of the queer community. Um, so I am using this opportunity as an example, um, using my privilege in ways to provide education and um, you know build bridges, try to fix things that are wrong in our culture and our society, um, and also support um, students and also other professionals like you all who are listening today um, about how we can work towards being more inclusive. Um, I've even heard even just today that this language is always changing. So even today I heard that now a lot of times people have been saying diversity, equity, inclusion, but there's also um, two letters added now, A for accessibility um, and B for belonging. So um, the point is that a lot of this language is constantly shifting and changing, um, and there's always opportunities to learn and to grow. Okay, so first, um, I like to start with talking about what is identity. So um, identity is complex, it's multifaceted, and it's a concept that encompasses how individuals perceive themselves and how they are perceived by others. So this can include elements such as personal beliefs, values, experiences, cultural background, social roles, physical characteristics. Um, it can include religion, spirituality, and 
other similar communities. Um, it can touch on sexual orientation. Um, and then it can be static and kind of be consistent, such as if grew up Christian my whole life is one example. If I continue to be Christian until the end of my, my life, there might be nuances and changes within that. However, there can be those types of identities that stay static. Um, or maybe my my perception and my thoughts on my race might might stay throughout my life. Um, however, at the same time, a lot of aspects of identity can be fluid um, and um, changes over time. Um, people can have new experiences, new challenges. Um, so identity is about the interplay between the self and the broader so social context, in influencing how people navigate the world and connect with others. And also to acknowledge this concept of um, identity is how other people see you. And it's also how you might see yourself. How might you intentionally present to yourself? You can present one way to present um, an image that you're trying to present, um, but you might feel a little differently. There might be different aspects to that um, or different areas that you show to some groups and, and different faces that you show in other groups. And all that is normal part of identity and interactive with other humans. So um, continuing that, um, it can be self-assigned and it also can be imposed by others, right? Um, it can be imposed by society like um, beauty standards and, and um, body shaming, body expectations. Um, do I have a positive expectation or perception of myself as a beautiful person? Is that a part of my identity? Do I feel like I'm an ugly person? That can be a part of my identity. Um, and so there's that aspect, which can be influenced by culture. It can be groups that are assuming that you are maybe a certain race by the way your skin your skin color looks. Um, so I know there are times that people might present as white, but they have other identities that are of black and brown heritage, for example. Um, but these are just examples of how it might be imposed by others. And then also has to do with self-assigned, um, such as my own coming out experiences, identifying as queer um, is an example of a self-identifying identity. Um, something that I might stress a couple times during the presentation is to acknowledge that to promote inclusivity, it's important to let the individual express their own identity rather than just assuming someone else's identity. Um, so although that happens because of um, society, like we said, or when things identities are imposed, um, it's important to kind of do some self-check and try to make sure that we're not assuming and placing identities on others, especially if we're working towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so diversity. Um, by definition, it sh means showing a great deal of variety, uh, things that are very different, um, and it is the practice of including or involving people from different range of social and ethnic backgrounds and a lot of different, I mean, and other different races, gender, sexual orientation, physical disabilities, et cetera. Um, these, there's a continuous list, right, of things that can make a group diverse or not, or how you're looking at it through the lens of gender, through the lens of race, through the lens of abilities. Um, there's different lenses to look through to evaluate if something is considered diverse. Um, so everyone kind of might have their own perception. Um, and it's something to consider is your own experiences, right? Do you come from a diverse community or do you come from like a homogeneous culture um, where everybody is kind of the same? Um, the United States varies throughout, throughout the various uh, regions, right? I'm in New York City right now, and here in New York, we have a wide, diverse population here in the city. And at the same time, there's communities that are um, separated and um, segregated um, intentionally, maybe when they came, but over time, they've stayed culturally in their areas. There's different areas of the city that um, are more populated by certain um, ethnicities and cultures. And so um, that's what I've observed since being in, in the city area. So for this, I'd like to show this video. Do you have it on another tab? Bear with me if I can um, switch to show this and make sure the sound works, but please let me know if uh, it 
it's not working. Let me share and switch to this page. And I'm going to play this. If I can, if I cannot, we will skip to the next thing. And zoom. Audio. Sorry, this is always tricky. I've done this a couple times. And just gonna ask if Sunny can text message me to let me know if if you can hear that. Yeah, sorry, Joe. I don't think we could hear or see the video. Oh, you can't even see it? No. I'm so sorry. All right, we're gonna take we're not gonna do the video then. It's not not a worry. I'm gonna explain the video. Thank you for um responding, folks who responded. Um let me just switch back to my screen. Okay, you see the presentation now, right? I think it's stuck at what is privilege. Right, okay, that's perfect. That's just the slide it's on. I, I've i been playing with the PowerPoint and trying to get it to work in the PowerPoint and I said I would pull it up. Sorry about all that. But um, let me just continue. So in that video, um, they give examples. They have a group of people that start at the same starting point um, and they give different prompts, like, did you have to worry about, um, do you worry about where your next meal is coming from? Or did you, I think they do it more focused towards the childhood. So did you have to worry about your um, next meal growing up? Do you have to worry about um, your safety when you're out on the street alone? Do you have to worry about um, provide doing public display of affection in public for your safety? Um, things like that. And the people step forward at different places. And by the end of it, you can see that the people that have really stepped forward and, and what levels of privilege they have. Um, and you see some folks that are more towards the back and didn't have that privilege. And it's a really visual way to see it. So what I can do is um, after this, I can share with Sunny to make sure that I share those videos and you have an opportunity to view that on your own time. Um, I typically go over this with students um, within our child life student programming at my hospital um, and I suggest that they watch that in advance so um, I wanted to incorporate that into this conversation so I encourage you to take the time after um, to look it over and um, the next there's another activity I can send with it too um, so let me just read going back to my notes here um, privilege does not always make itself known um, especially those who are like in the front of the class are unaware. So it's one of the things that comes up in the video is that um, people say, oh, I didn't realize how much privilege I had until I realized how ahead of everybody I was. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, and it reflects a lot of reality. A lot of times people don't realize how much privilege they have. Um, and usually that in itself is the privilege. If you don't recognize that, you know, some, some people are thinking about where their next meal comes for an example, then you might you don't think about it. You know where your mail is coming from. You're not re really aware. Um, it takes education to become aware of these things. Um, so some folks have said, like, I don't think I'm privileged because I grew up really poor or I grew up um, with certain disadvantages. And so they recognize that they don't feel like they have privilege in those um, instances. However, it's important to acknowledge that when we're talking about this concept of privilege, we're talking about long existing systems um, that have benefited some and oppressed others that have not always been so visible on an individual scale. 
um, where if you were to pick two two people, um, it might not directly exp um, show itself, but it's observable at a macro level when you look at society as a whole um, and community and statistics accordingly. Um, so one, one thought to kind of challenge yourself is that everybody is privileged in one way or another. Um, and so we're gonna look at the, the next slide is gonna show you a privilege wheel. And so that shows different areas of our identities and experiences. Um, and you can see, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking to my left. I have the PowerPoint here to my left, but I wanna see it bigger. And I wanna acknowledge that the outside is the most marginalized, generally speaking. Um, and the inside is the more privileged within the context of this specific environment, which to me looks Amer fair, fairly American standards. Um, so I, I'm not going to be able to speak on what privilege looks like in all the other countries and all throughout the world or in different communities. But because it's important to acknowledge that um, diversity, excuse me, not diversity, privilege is impacted by the lens of the community that you're in. So some communities might hold a higher value to certain um, values of these um, attributes. Um, but for example, we have white being the most privileged and the darker your skin, the more marginalized you you would be, you could be. And that's, that's, we know that to be true in the United States. Um, and then we have able-bodied and then as the, as a privilege, and then some disability and moving out to less um, significantly disabled. Um, so you can see how some of these categories, you might be closer to the power point in the middle, um, the power of privilege, um, where other areas you might be closer to the marginalized, everybody's experiences are different, but this is important to explore kind of and evaluate yourself to kind of think about where am I in this story? Um, what are my experiences and what is my perception? Am I at the front of the class? Um, am I at the back of the class? Things like that. So it can be helpful to visualize yourself um, in the different areas of privilege. Um, so I think I've acknowledged already that I have at least, I've, I have a lot of privileges. So when I looked at this one, I said I have about eight out of the 12 center privileges. So it acknowledges the power that I have. And so the question is like, what am I doing with it, right? And so one of the things is doing things like this, doing this presentation, providing education. Um, it's important to utilize our areas of privilege to support those who are more marginalized. Um, so that way the burden of you know, advocacy and inclusion um, and encouraging belonging, don't fall on the responsibility of the marginalized, don't become a burden of those who are marginalized, but rather um, the responsibility is taken by the ones that have the privilege. Um, <clears throat> looking at my notes, and I think I have addressed most of this. One example is I, I do identify as Christian. I did grow up Christian. Um, and so this is an example of how that um, privilege can vary from different environments. So in the United States, in the jobs that I've worked, I've always had the privilege of being off on most holidays um, that I celebrate, like Christmas and Easter examples. And then if I was not off, for example, I've worked on Easter before and I've been compensated in the past with a time and a half compensation. Um, and it's a conversation with my leadership. So there's a level of privilege in that. I have Christian privilege within my my nation. I see Christianity represented well throughout um, culture and throughout government. Um, and not every other faith or religion has that or, or, or no religion, right? Not everybody has that representation. So I have Jewish colleagues who at their time with their time with PTO and time off, here at my job, they have to arrange their schedule and move their vacation times and all of that, move their holiday days around as much as they can to compensate for and to be able to have the time off that um, they need for any religious observances. So it's just an example um, of my religious uh, privilege. And also these colleagues of mine have told me that in previous experiences, when they were in communities that were mostly Jewish, for example, they already had those times off planned because everybody also had those times off planned. And if I 
were to go and work in a place like that, I wouldn't have that privilege as much because my days would not have been recognized. My days being the ones that I observe, like Christmas, might not have been recognized and they might have been expected to work if I were to work in the, com the Jewish community, for example. Um, so that's just what that means by the lens can vary. Okay. So what's the difference between equality and equity? Um, equality means an indiv each individual or group of people is given the same, the exact same resources or opportunities. Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates to the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. So I love the next graphic. This really helps to um, once again, to visualize what this means. Um, so reality is the, the crates there that the person is standing on that you don't even see them, they're so high up there, represent this, this concept of privilege. And so the one who, the rea this is the reality, unfortunately, um, is that people who have, um, excuse me, let me read this, it's small, is uh, the one who gets more than is needed while the other gets less than is needed. Um, thus, a huge disparity is created. So this is reality and inequities um, within culture. I, we see it all the time. Um, equality would be giving them all the same crate, right? And even within that, if you think if you gave everyone a crate, that first, that first person would have even been a crate higher. So um, then equity is when you give everybody what they need to be able to see the game. These three, three people, these three characters are able to now finally all see the game. And then this is a beautiful analogy because once you get to justice would be if there was no barriers at all, no fence at all, and everyone could see based off of where they were. So that's like the end goal, um, but that's something we're always gonna be working towards. I mean, as of right now. Um, so the next topic is moving into systematic racism and inequities within the healthcare, right? Because we're talking about pediatric care. We're talking about our work as child life specialist or prospective child life specialist. Um, so these are some of the topics that are important to be aware of. Um, and that includes access to healthcare, such as do our patients and families have insurance or what expenses are they being expected to pay for with their insurances? Um, what are their, do they need to maintain their job at the same time to maintain their insurance, to maintain their resources, to be able to provide support to the child that's um, hospitalized? Um, and what types of benefits and employment support do they have? Um, I've had patients that their parents are able to work from the room and there's no expectation on what's how, how much hours they're putting in. And they've been very flexible to support a child when their child's hospitalized for months. And then I've had a parent, parents that are not able to be at bedside. And why? It's because they're providing for their family. They're providing for that child to have the insurance that they need. Um, and so those are just two opposite examples of different experiences. And so how can we provide support as child life specialists within the healthcare system? What can we do acknowledging that is is one thing important um, and also to like consider we're going to talk about it I believe a little bit but our our biases and how we perceive and engage with patients and families um, sometimes they might have insurance but they don't have a way to be transferred transported right they don't have a way to get there so do they have the resources to get to their health care support um, same with parents. Sometimes I've had parents that are not able to come all the time because they have to go home and care for their other child or children, and they have a hard time with the transportation to go back and forth. So um, all these can ex um, affect the experience of the patient. So, and then which providers you see. So there can be, you have public health and there's certain limited options for who you can see. Um, and those ones that they can be seen, whether it's not their their quality of care might not be good with who the provider is, or maybe it's because that provider is seeing so many patients, they're only able to spend less time with the patient where somebody who has more resources, more more privilege, right, is able to, um, and, and this is talking about racism, so is statistically that um, if 
if people of a lighter skin color have more benefits than the darker skin color, that's what we see in healthcare. Um, and then research and funding towards certain illnesses. So they have done lots of various medical researches over the years. And so uh, the question of each individual article, if you're um, when you're doing your research projects and things, I challenge you to look at who is the population? Does it show a, a spectrum of different participants? Um, or is it focused to more um, people of a certain um, ethnicity, right? And maybe that is a, a good thing because maybe it's focused on, on building equity by working towards studying people of color and uh, black and brown people and Latin, Latin A, Latin X people to learn about their bodies and to learn about what will be helpful for them. Um, and so that's important to acknowledge is that research has been biased in the past. Um, and these are areas that we want to look towards fixing towards the future. Um, sometimes it's about preventative care. So a lot of people with privilege, right? and this, this continues with the topic of race, is might have access to things such as education around what does preventative care look like? Do you see your regular doctor regularly? Does your doctor provide the appropriate referrals when needed? Um, what things do you need to do for your own hygiene and your own health? What about diet and exercise? Those things, are they provided in a way that communities and of race and various races, including people of color, um, are they being having access to this information? And there might be a lot of investment and resources with groups of privilege, which is often lighter skin um, or white communities that do have a lot of investment into teaching children in young age, all of these things about your health, growing up and supporting that process. Um, and, and that can lead towards longer health effects, right? A longer healthy healthy futures. Um, continues with education in the community. Um, and then stereotyping can influence care. So um, one example is I think later on the bottom, it says the pain assessment. There are stereotypes about, there's statistics about, and I think I referenced some of the articles below, um, where people of color are not taken as serious when it comes to their pain. Their assessments are assumed a false belief as if the person is wanting just to abuse medication. Uh, meanwhile, people with lighter skin and white people can go into hosp hospitals and providers and statistically been given medicine for pain medicines very easily, very quickly. They take their pain very serious. So um, that's an example of um, the, the inequities there. And there can be some stereotypes behind that, right? So oh, well, they just want the medication for drugs because um, they just want the feeling they're addicted to it. Um, and then, then there are, I mean, there are various other, other stereotypes that we can see. Um, this can influence, I had a patient one time where the patient had a fall and folks, and of course this is a, 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 black, a black child, a black mother, and um, within, within the healthcare, People didn't believe the story. The story was that she, the child fell within the laundry room and then a table fell on top of the head. So it was a double impact trauma. And people thought that, oh, well, maybe this could be child abuse. And it took the video from the laundry mat to come out to show that that was literally what happened. And people just were having their own biases and their own stereotypes that were coming into play when making their assessment. Um, and I continued to work with this patient and family, and I continued to see other challenges. People felt like this mom wasn't fit for her child, despite the fact that that had nothing to do with why she, the child was injured. Um, and so I was trying to be an active part of challenging the team, like, no, let's reconsider what we're, what we're providing and why. Um, and so that was an ongoing challenge and an example of where I seen um, the systematic racism come up. And then seeing providers that look like the patient. Um, so that can affect how much the patient trusts the provider, the healthcare provider, 
And of course, if you consider our perspective from a child life perspective, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build trust and rapport with the child. We're using play. We're trying to help them to feel comfortable and safe. So that way they will want to engage with us. Um, but in general, this can happen, including with adults. Um, if folks don't trust their provider, then they will be less likely to be truthful, less likely to be open with them about their body, their health. Um, they may be less likely to see their provider. Um, the effects of that um, distrust could go on and on, right? I mean, we saw this with um, COVID-19 um, with the, um, the vaccines. Um, a lot of Black communities were not trusting the healthcare system, and therefore, statistically, it was shown that a lot of Black, Brown, um, but typically Black people were, were declining the vaccination because they did not trust the healthcare system. Oops. So um, speaking of COVID, um, in New York City's lowest, lowest income communities, they were impacted the hardest with COVID-19. Um, these areas had higher reported cases of death rates. Um, Hispanic and Black communities or excuse me, Latin, Latinx, Latin A, Hispanic, Black communities were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Um, this map is showing the density of death rates, right? So the darker the color, the more dense of deaths occurred in those, for residents in those areas. And um, bear with me, I'm gonna skip this video because we know video is not working. So if you look at that map originally, and then you look at this map, this map is based off of um, ethnicities in certain areas. Um, <clears throat> and the darker colors are darker areas. Um, it's it's very it's specifically there. The There's Asian and Latinx in the, the dark area. And um, the, the one in the middle, I don't know if I can use a pointer. Let me see. You can see this. This area, this is where the hospital is that... Um, this video is about. And so that was in this area where there's higher deaths is in areas of people of color is, is something to acknowledge. And the reason we talk about this, this hospital, I'm talking about this video is a hospital in Queens um, in New York City. It's a New York City public health hospital. Um, and then that video is one of the doctors that works there who is acknowledging we've been promised from government that we're gonna get support. We don't have enough ventilators to keep people alive and keep people safe. Um, and we don't have the vents and people are dying. And so that was an active place where they didn't have the resources and they weren't being supported in the way that other communities might've had the resources, um, had the finances to be able to provide the ventilators that they needed. Um, so I am reviewing the notes here. But yes, it was low income areas or racial populations surrounding the areas that experienced the higher death rates. And so we see inequity and through racial inequities and um, systematic issues within the COVID-19 uh, deaths that happen. Um, so now I wanna move into the concept of how can we take child life theory and practice and um, evaluate it in the sense of diversity, equity, inclusion. So how much of our theory and teachings come from a Eurocentric or white Eurocentric background and perspective? How much does this role um, play in our perceptions and our lens when we're evaluating patients and families? Um, and how does it play a role in our goals of care? And do you think that, um, and these are like, you know, I want you to self self reflect and think about these questions as you challenge yourself. But do you think goals of care can vary based on the patient and family that you're providing psychosocial support for? So this is I don't have the answer. I don't know exactly. Um, and and when I started and said that, you know, I'm not a person of color. I'm not an expert. I didn't say that. I wanted to say that I'm not an expert in the field of how to be diverse, how to be equitable all the time. But these are from what I understand and the knowledge that I can share. Um, and these are ways to move forward. And I'm always open to learning more. But the reason I say that now is because I don't know the answer behind this, but all of our child developmental theory is all, as you see here, um, white Eurocentric perspectives. Um, and you can see the names here, Freud, Erickson, Piaget, Bowlby, Watson, 
um, Skinner, Bandura, Bogotsky, and I can never say his name correctly, Ron Fenbrenner. All of them have white Eurocentric backgrounds. And so they are the foundation on how we look at child development. They are the foundation on how we provide support from a child life perspective. So we need to be mindful of that when we're using that. Like, is there anything that we need to evaluate? And, and this is an area of further research, right? When we do research, um, part of research is acknowledging where future research needs to be done. Um, and I'm very interested in the idea of child development and where, um, where can we study? How can we study and look at if... Um, if this developmental perspective is universal or what areas are universal of our perspective, understanding of child development and human development and what areas might not be universal. Um, so yeah, this is something to have some self-reflection on and, and in the future, hopefully future research. So what do we do as child life specialists or providing care within a pediatric setting? Um, it's important to provide individualized care not approaching a patient with assumptions, predetermined knowledge, and instead meet the patient family ready to learn about their story and their experiences, their individualized need. Um, so this, I, I always say, it doesn't mean that you don't learn about a culture and have some knowledge going into it. For example, I work with a um, wide spectrum of a lot of Jewish community, um, the Hasidic Jewish community, as well as the Orthodox community. Um, and I have had to learn a lot that I am not familiar because I'm not Jewish. And um, I've learned a lot within my role in my current job because that's a big population that I serve. Um, uh, I had a large um, learning gap at the beginning or learning curve, I, I mean to say. Um, and then over time, I, I had to <clears throat> learn that the things that I've learned is not applicable to everybody, right? So um, I learned what questions to ask instead of what answers to give, right? I learned to say on Shabbos, when folks, do you observe Shabbos? Which means they don't, if they do, they often do not use electronics. Um, so do you recognize, do you observe Shabbos? And if they say yes, what types of toys do your children play with on Shabbos? So um, that's just an example, but um, the point is assumptions versus predetermined knowledge. Um, we want to provide patient and family-centered care, right? And that's a big value within the healthcare system, as well as um, from the ACLP and goals of child life. And um, within that, which we're going to go to the next slide, there's definitely areas where diversity, equity, inclusion um, are important. Um, advocating for the patient's needs. And of course, this is something that we do in child life all the time. This is like a basic concept. However, in the context to diversity, equity, inclusion, what are the cultural needs of that patient and family? What are the socio and economical aspects of their needs that we can provide support to, right? Because um, not every, as we've thought about with the example with the crates and the image earlier about equity versus equality, not everybody needs the same amount of crates, right? Some might need a little bit more. And so there are times that you're going to provide more services, more support and advocate for certain things that are appropriate for that patient and family. And that's one thing of being, being mindful of that, that is going to come into play with your care. Um, being adaptable and creative to meet the individual where they are. Um, another Aspect is, is when I mentioned at the beginning, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging. Accessibility is a lot about the able-bodied um, versus those who are less abled or utilize other resources to, to be abled um, or disabled. And that might be adaptability, right? Having things, a playroom that's accessible for all various um kids and experiences, making sure that we have ways to adapt things so that way um, things are available for all of our patients. Um, it also is about being adaptable internally and things about things that maybe you imagine for a patient in care, making sure that we adapting them to what the patient family actually need. Um, making sure we're standing up for patient and families when you witness specific inequities injustices and advocating appropriately for policy changes within the hospital. So one thing is the example I shared earlier with the patient who had fallen and was injured. Um, 
and how she, um, I advocated for equality. I was advocating for equity. I was advocating like to challenge the thoughts and the biases that were coming up. And like, why do you think that if a nurse maybe made this assumption or made a statement, why do you say that? Oh, is that why you say that? Because of maybe one thing she observed. And um, I, I think when, one example is that everyone thought she wasn't involved and wasn't here and didn't want to engage. And I noticed that she was struggling to know how to engage with her child within the context of her injury. So I was like, well, it sounds like she just needed some education because when I was in there, I was able to provide some support and I saw her model those things when, during my interaction and to show she is capable. She just needs the tools, the tools to do that. Um, and then policy changes. Um, that is always something we want to be working towards. Um, here at my hospital, we have a diversity, equity, inclusion group. So um, there have been times that I've reached out to, to that group um, to advocate for some changes that may be helpful within our hospital. Um, even one example, I've shared about some coworkers that are Jewish. Um, we're working in the OR. They didn't have any um, sterile scrubs for, for my colleague. Um, and we work together to communicate with diversity, equity, inclusion, um, committee is what I'm trying to say, committee or panel. Um, and they're the ones that are work together to really advocate for them within the hospital as a broader sense. So we are able to advocate for those to us to get the right um, scrubs that met their, their needs that allowed them to have their religious observance within their work life. Um, continuing, being culturally aware, learning about cultures. So sometimes this means like I shared earlier where um, you have a certain population that you see a lot of in your hospital and you might have to take the time to learn things about them, about the, those cultures in general, remembering not to take those and apply them to every patient that comes in that comes from a similar background. Um, and so also we can look, you can look for options for various cultural and ethnic representation within your environment such as um, decorations, toys, movies, music, games. Um, one example with, I'm going on the, the Jewish example today is that there's actually Jewish stores that sell toys that are in Hebrew and Yiddish um, and they sell certain things. So we're working with, with those, those toy um, stores to get toys that are appropriate for those communities. So that way, when they come into the playroom, they see things that they're familiar with, things that are safe, things that represent them and help them to connect with, um, you know, the services that we're offering. And another example of this is like Band-Aids when you can get skin color. Um, the reason that they're originally in a certain light tone color, the idea is have it blend in with your skin, but that doesn't match everyone's skin color, right? So even today, recently I was looking and we had um, the different Band-Aids, but there's different colors for different um, skin colors. Um, I say refer here because um, I utilize this presentation in other areas and I have made something for a previous job of mine, um, but it's something I'm happy to share with you to explore where it shows you different examples of toys or different resources, things to learn. Um, and so that's something that also is an area that you could work on in the future within your hospital setting is um, what resources and connections and inclusive activities and toys can we have here to make this a inclusive and safe space? Um, and so with the first topic, sometimes the cultural awareness and learning about others is about learning about a group and general because you have a lot of those patient populations coming in. And sometimes it's you have that one patient that comes from a culture and community and experience that you do not know anything about. And you have to work to learn, to understand. You have to work to listen, to understand to that patient, to that family. Um, so that way you can properly support them. Um, so there was a good presentation um, by James Burroughs. That's what this quote is from, it's paraphrase, excuse me. Um, but I took this example from this presentation and um, I thought it was appropriate to share. So consider when a patient comes in with the example that it's an African-American girl, there may be some things going on in the community such as that, excuse me, observing racial injustice, violence, um, let's, which lets us see the ugly side of racism and the ugly side of 
differences within culture. And that's not something that the patient can leave outside the door when they come in to get health care. Um, so I thought that was a, a valuable um, example and story. Um, it was a story that this presenter gave, but I paraphrased it for the sake of the presentation. And so going back to our family-centered care, um, these values that we emphasize in child life, and um, I'm not going to go through them all, but I want to encourage you to review them. And I always challenge students when I'm, I'm discussing with them in smaller groups to pick out one element and recognize how, how you see diversity, equity, and inclusion being played out in that and how you can incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion in that. Um, let me pick one now. So facilitating parent and professional collaboration, um, element two. Um, for that, it makes me think of encouraging the proper family meetings, encouraging um, the proper communication aspects, acknowledging where is that patient and family coming from. So um, a very common interview response that we hear within child life when folks are interviewing for student programming is um, the example for diversity and inclusion being the interpreter, right? Having an interpreter. Um, that's the most baseline um, point. Um, like we definitely need to be giving that to them. That's a, a legal a legal right that makes sense with the care. But even further than that, do they are they understanding what's happening with the interpreter? Is that interpreter a strong interpreter or not a strong interpreter? Did they walk away from these meetings feeling included and heard? Are these decisions feeling like the doctors and nurses are saying this is what's happening? Period. Or is there more of an a discussion? Are there concerns being heard? Um, I've had times where I've heard people outside of the meetings refer to the parents as illegals when they were um, undocumented immigrants. So um, that was something I spoke up and was like, the correct term is um, undocumented uh, because that shows how they navigate in society where um, the term illegal is really objectifying people. Um, it's vilifying them, making them into bad people or um, dehumanizing them, right? So um, that's just an example related to parent and professional collaboration. So language interpreters, um, there's ways to use the interpreter, such as actually you really should be engaging with the patient directly to make them feel connected with, to um, make eye contact and let the interpreter speak your words. Um, in their language, um, but the conversation is between you and that person. So um, these are small little tips and tricks that can be really helpful in making these interactions with an interpreter more impactful. Um, also getting comfortable with it. I know I've, I've seen where professionals are nervous to go in and utilize interpreter or they say, oh, well, that's gonna be a whole big thing. So why don't we just do a drop off of toys and move on? Um, but what you're taking away their care, you're taking away the assessment that you would provide with an English speaking family. Um, and it can truly impact what you're able, able to recognize as a need for you to be able to even respond to that need. And that is what inequity is, right? Um, so this is kind of where we need to do some self-evaluation. Why am I not going in the room? Is it because I'm intimidated by interpreter? Well, the more you use the interpreter, the more comfortable you're going to feel and the more confident you're going to feel in your skills to be able to provide an adequate um, assessment and intervention. Um, conversations should not be had without an interpreter. So that's a very base given situation. But I have seen it with, with providers walking in and doing that. Um, and it's important to advocate in those, in those contexts. Um, sorry, this is a lot of details around our hospital specifically. And then um, I have the symbol of, of this. This is for interpreter. This is for sign language interpreter. Um, but that sometimes it's it's important to acknowledge getting someone to come in person. So that, that could be something that goes back to learning the culture. So I know the deaf community fairly well. And I do know that there's a lot of factors of sign language that have to do with depth perception. And so on an iPad, it does not help. Um, sometimes it can make the communication more difficult. And then you add in the Wi-Fi issues, the glitching and whatnot, it can make such a huge impact where if you have an in-person interpreter with ASL, 
they can provide a much more engaging interaction and really include the family. Um, understanding and recognizing that we all come from different religion, faith, and spiritual experiences and backgrounds um, and beliefs. So how do you think that these might be seen in the medical environment? Well, it might be um, how much community and support they have. They may have a church community that's involved in their lives, or they may not. They may not be um, connected. They may have a spiritual and emotional strength that comes from their religion and faith and spirituality. They also could go through a crisis and that could be impacting their experience. So um, it can impact decision-making processes such as um, removing care um, or a blood transfusion. Um, there's, it could involve, a chaplain could be involved in supporting them and having it be like working out their faith and their ethical perspectives on what's best for their child. Um, and then it's about it's the the religion and faith and community from their faith faith communities can impact their their self value um, and really how they're presenting. So sometimes it's I I might be a religious practice such as Christian because I believe that versus these communities of such as like the Jewish communities that are really intertwined with their Jewish faith their their faith and their community is there every day um it can really be a much a much stronger core sense of their identity so we can see that come out in um the patients that we work with and so what's your role is is being aware that we all come from different places recognizing our biases recognizing what our faith and beliefs are or are not um and that's okay it's okay to not have that belief when you go into the room of a of a faith uh, believing family, right? But how do we meet the family where we are and how do we put our perspectives at the door? Um, and, and I shouldn't say at the door because I don't mean to say you, you get rid of it, but how do you acknowledge it and incorporate it in a way that you are supporting the family? Um, and sometimes it takes processing, sometimes it takes supervision, um, like clinical supervision with a supervisor or someone else that's more experienced um, or has more um, clinical years in the field profession. Oh, and, and I realizing that the word multi-faith, it's important to acknowledge that a lot of chaplains within the hospital are trained to be able to provide support for a wide spectrum of people. Um, and within my hospital, they are, we have multi-faith chaplaincy and then they have like a Catholic priest available when a certain family feels like they need that or a rabbi when the Jewish family feels like they need that. Um, but in general, um, the chaplains are able to see and support people, um, generally speaking, based on the preferences of the, the individual. So then LGBTQ plus is what I normally say, IA. Um, I did include those to, on purpose. I wanted to share those language, but this means lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, Queer, questioning, intersect, asexual, or gray sexual, and the plus means there's many other identity identities that people are included in to be considered within the queer community. Um, you can see this sign here. Uh, the The image shows a bunch of different flags, and those are all different flags that represent different identities within the, the community. Um, it's important to educate yourselves on these topics and categories, and it's important to acknowledge that um, couple things. One is sexual orientation and gender identity are different. Um, so sexual orientation is about emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction to others. Gender identity is about identifying as male or female or neither or both. Um, and I encourage you all to do some research and educate yourself within these topics uh, because it's really, as I said in another area earlier, it's really important that the person who's trying to be inclusive and learn about others, right? Do take the responsibility upon themselves to learn about how they can be supporting to others. Um, and so a lot of the times you wanna be doing your own research and not putting that burden on other people, not that responsibility or that burden on other people. Um, it's okay to ask what somebody's preferences are and not assume, but you should have some base of knowledge and, and concept of what loosely, before you are interacting with somebody and making 
so that way you can support them and their needs the best. Um, and then also family dynamics and different structures. So all families look different ways um, and all family, family structures are valid. So keep in mind not to have expectations. Family have unique rules and cultural norms. So it's important to understand that families can look different ways. They can consider one parent, two parents, maybe more parents. Parents can be of different genders and identities. Step or mixed families can be involved. Um, sometimes a patient may have no family at all. And that's important to know um, because uh, the times luckily nurses have given me the heads up, um, but you walk in and you say, you know, how's mom or dad? And you find out that they don't have a caregiver. They were just removed from their home or um, how is mom? And you find out that mom had passed away, right? So these are all assumptions that we want to try to be mindful of and try to remove before we engage with family. So instead of saying, oh, how's mom? Say, who is with you in the hospital today? Just one small example of how we can provide, this is like applicable techniques that can be used um, to understand how to come openly to a table with a patient family or to bedside, not to the table. Um, some families consist of non-biological people in their family. Um, and also some families, and it's not, not common, but there are some families that may consist of polyamorous parents or ethical non-monogamy parents um, or community style families. So that's something to acknowledge. And um, I think I, I touched on this before, but like not all Christian families look like this. Not all Jewish families look like this. Not all same gendered families have these expectations, right? So once again, learning about what these families, these communities might present, what are values that are important to them, but then learning that individual patient and family um, is really going to be the, the factor in how you're going to make them feel heard, supported, seen, and inclusive, and including them um, to provide a sense of belonging. And that concludes my presentation today. Um, I thank you all for participating by listening. And now I invite any questions that may come up um, from anything that was shared today. Can't say I know all the answers. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I will work on getting some type of response and, and bringing that back to you in some level. Um, but I am open for questions. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, if you can also let me share my video. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it. You can see me. <laughs> so um, want me to send the host back to you? Okay, awesome. Let's see if I can figure this out. Oh, we have a question. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. No I muted you. Yeah. You said we have a question. I'm making you the host, and then I can look at this question here. Awesome. Yeah. It's a, you get a copy of the slides. Thanks. Yes, for definitely. Yes. Um, I will be sending out um, an email with just next steps. If you guys are interested in earning a PDU, that's something we can absolutely share. And Joe, thank you so much for this very informative, uh, but very important topic. I think it's very, you know, I learned so much um, in terms of, you know, making sure we check our own personal biases. Um, and, you know, creating an environment and I loved your point of making sure we're able to uh, get to know the family and the patient first because I think that's very important we do want to be you know mindful of the diff cultural differences but also within each family unit they have their own values um, and beliefs that we also want to be uh, we're aware of so you know I think there was I took so I took a lot of notes um, and so I learned a lot thank you again